So, so hello, good morning, and good evening. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be able to speak at the Global Summit on Infectious Diseases 2021. I understand that the theme of this year's conference is global strategies to treat infectious diseases. And today's presentation, I'd like to focus um, briefly the discussion on oral antiviral drugs, specifically favipiravir, along with the optimal timing for initiating antiviral therapeutics. Uh, so the disclaimer, I'm going to go ahead and skip that. Okay. So before we actually get into the subject of antiviral therapies, it's important to note that more than 255 million cases of coronavirus have been confirmed to date with more than 5.1 million deaths. So a good place to start off this discussion uh, would be on favipiravir, on what kind of drug this is and what sort of mechanism of action um, this particular oral antiviral offers. So favipiravir is, an, is a small molecule nucleic acid analog. It's an oral pill and it's very well absorbed after administration. The drug and the compound specifically target viral RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So the way this works is favipiravir after ingestion and absorption is first incorporated into the host cells. The drug is then converted to favipiravir ribofurinosyl phosphates by the host cell enzymes. The triphosphate form, which is favipiravir RTP, is the actual compound that inhibits viral RNA polymerase activity. So we like this drug specifically because it has a very broad spectrum antiviral activity um, against genetically unrelated viral families. And we'll get into that in our next slide. So this slide describes or illustrates the broad spectrum activity of favipiravir against a broad host of RNA viruses. Um, this includes influenza viruses, which the drug was originally developed for. Um, it also includes arenaviruses, uh, Lassa, Hanta, uh, Ebola, Marburg, et cetera. While the drug is generally considered very safe with a, with a very reputable safety profile, there are a number of contraindications that we should be discussing. Specifically, the drug is absolutely contraindicated in women who are either known or suspected to be pregnant. Uh, this is because of the risk that we've seen in animal studies of, of potential early embryonic death or teratogenicity. So thank goodness we've, we've treated more than 1.5 million patients worldwide with this drug. We've been very careful about how we instruct our physicians on the ground on how to administer the drug and what to be mindful of. And I think we're very happy that we have an excellent track record for safety um, and the legacy has been maintained with regard to not having a single case of human embryonic death or human teratogenicity uh, associated with the use of this drug. And this is a, a legacy that we hope uh, and, and will emphatically ensure that, that it, it is maintained throughout the years to come. So a little bit on the efficacy end of the discussion. This is a Japanese observational trial that was conducted and is ongoing actually on favipiravir. The study design actually involves more than 490 centers throughout Japan. Um, it has recruited more than 2,200 patients to date. And the patients, uh, given the observational nature of this trial, there is no control arm, but the patients who were administered favipiravir were given uh, the drug at a dose of 1,800 milligrams VID, followed Dr. Richard, sorry to interrupt. We are unable to hear audio. Dr. Richard?
Dr. Richard, we are unable to hear your audio. I just sent Richard yes, yes, yes. Now oh, it's perfect. Oh, sorry. Richard, uh, you dropped off there for a moment. Your sound. Oh, God. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, beautiful. Um, so, 14 days after administration of the drug, you see the percentage of patients who improved in each of the clinical categories um, improved to 88%, 85%, and 60% in the mild, moderate, and severe disease categories, um, uh, respectively. So, of course, whenever we're talking about a novel therapeutic, we have to balance out the efficacy with safety. And in this Japanese observational study, they did just that. Um, they looked at the number of adverse events and the uh, what type of adverse events were, were um, identified in this ongoing observational trial. They found that 15% of the patients uh, did present with transient hyperuricemia, and 7.3% of the patients presented with uh, elevated. So basically, the Japanese observational trial is great as it gives us uh, a slight indication as to the efficacy uh, and safety of the drug. But again, it's not a controlled study. So here is an actual controlled study that came out of China in the earlier phases of the, of the pandemic. And it's a study that was designed to evaluate, again, the efficacy and safety of favipiravir on COVID-19 patients. It was an open-label, non-randomized trial, um, which had two arms comparing favipiravir with uh, the Coletra drug, Coletra being a combination of lopinavir and ritonavir. The primary endpoints that they applied in this study were viral clearance and improvements in chest CT. So you can see here that the median time to viral clearance was significantly shorter for favipiravir when we compared that against the combination of lopinavir and ritonavir. The actual days um, were four days in the favipiravir group versus 11 days in the Coletra group. Um, so this is, a, this is an interesting finding that's associated with this study. In addition to that, uh, what was interesting about this study was this study was actually observing the changes in radiographic uh, findings. And what they found was 14 days after uh, using the drug, they found that the improvement rate observed in the favipiravir patients was significantly higher compared to the patients who were given lopinavir and ritonavir um, at a rate of 91.4% versus 62.2%. Uh, um, they also did examine the number of adverse events. And in this study, um, they found that the total number of adverse events in the favipiravir arm of the study was 11.4%, which was actually significantly less than the comparator arm, which was the lopinavir ritonavir combination group, which found um, adverse events in more than 50% of their patients. So another study that came out of China, which was interesting, was a comparison uh, between favipiravir and another drug that we don't commonly, commonly use in Europe or the US or Japan uh, called umifenavir. Umifenavir is a drug that's commonly used in China or Russia um, to treat influenza patients and other viral indications as well. So in this study, they were looking to compare the clinical recovery rate at seven days from the start of treatment um, as their primary endpoint. So what they found was for ordinary patients with COVID-19, the seven-day clinical recovery rate for Arvidal or umifenavir was 55.8% versus 71% um, with the patients who were placed on favipiravir therapy. And these, these results were significantly different between the two groups. Um, for ordinary patients with COVID-19 and patients with hypertension and or diabetes, so these are the patients with um, high risk factors, the time of fever reduction and also cough relief in the favipiravir treatment group was also significantly um, improved. And we can see this on, on this slide. So we can see the on the left-hand side of your screen, you can see the latency to pyrexia followed by cough relief on the right-hand side of your screen. Again, the, the adverse events that were documented in this particular study were pretty much consistent with that observed in many of the other studies that have been conducted 
prior to this particular study and also studies that have been conducted after um, this study was published as well. The, uh, the, the most common uh, adverse event that we associate with the use of favipiravir is the transient um, serum, uh, uric acid levels that, that are elevated. And again, the key word here is transient. Once we stop the treatment, the elevated uric acid levels return to normal uh, quite rapidly. Uh, so those were smaller scale phase two trials. Um, and in recent months, the a Japanese team conduct, um, headed by Dr. Shinkai conducted a phase three trial in Japan. And this was a randomized, single blind, placebo controlled parallel group comparison design. Uh, what they did was we already had sufficient background um, on previous studies and on, on what the efficiency for um, e efficacy was and also for safety. So we already had a general knowledge um, that the drug um, would, would work in a certain way in this population. So what they did was they assigned the patients on a one to two basis into the favipiravir arm and also the placebo arm. So 107 patients were enrolled in the favipiravir arm. Uh, 49 patients were in, enrolled in the placebo arm. So again, a total of 156 patients, 49 assigned to placebo, 107 assigned to favipiravir, um, and the results uh, were based off of a composite outcome. And that composite outcome was defined as the time to improvement in one, body temperature, so how quickly uh, the fever improved in these patients, also oxygen saturation levels, the findings on chest imaging, and SARS-CoV-2 negativity. It's important to note that the patients who were enrolled in this study, one of the inclusion criteria were that the patients um, were diagnosed with mild COVID-19 pneumonia. So that means the patients already had to have uh, signs of inflammatory responses in their, in their lungs, and this was one of the prerequisites. The median time um, to meet the primary endpoint um, that we discussed above, which is the composite outcome, was 11.9 days in the favipiravir group versus 14.7 days in the placebo group. Now, uh, it's easy to confuse this and, and assume that 11.9 days and 14.7 days is actually pretty slow when, it, when we consider how quickly the average patient in the outpatient setting improves from their symptoms. But again, um, it's important to stress here that the patients enrolled in this study were patients with COVID-19 pneumonia. So of the individual COVID-19 symptoms, uh, what we had was we noticed improvements, significant improvements in the alleviation of a certain number of symptoms associated with COVID-19. These include headache, myalgia or arthralgia, and also fatigue or tiredness. Um, the other symptoms that you see on screen here showed no statistically significant differences between the two groups. The difference in the cumulative chest imaging improvement rates were actually pretty different, and they became increasingly apparent over the course, over the clinical course of the patients. So you'll notice that you know, on day four and day seven, there really was no statistically significant difference, but the real changes were noted in the patients after the day 10 mark. And after that, after day 10, we also did a, an analysis on day 13 and 16. Um, all of those days, uh, we could see that there's a significant difference between the favipiravir arm versus the placebo arm. So I think it's really important that before we summarize and conclude this presentation, um, it would be a great learning experience for all of us to revisit the theme of this year's conference, which is global strategies to treat infectious disease. There is no glo global strategy without antivirals, but when we're discussing the criticality of antiviral treatment, it's important to understand viral load dynamics as it allows us greater insight into the optimum therapeutic window for COVID-19. So after the initial exposure to SARS-CoV-2, as you can see on this graph, the patients will typically develop symptoms within five to six days. The exception, uh, of course, has been the Delta variant, which is an, a, an incubation period of about four days or less on average. So the, the graph or this curve um, for the viral dynamics does shift to the left a little bit for the for the Delta variant. But aside from that, um, this graphic is a pretty good representation 
of how the virus replicates in the, sim in the host after exposure. So uh, with that said, in general, the viral load does peak out within the first week of infection and thereafter naturally declines. So keeping that in mind, um, let's take a look at this graph. So the antiviral therapy is extremely challenging. And this is not only for COVID-19, but for other um, acute viral infections because antiviral therapies must be given early in the infection process to be effective. Um, this is not only true for COVID-19, but for other more common acute viral infections, such as influenza. So the cardinal rule for successful antiviral therapies is engaging that narrow therapeutic window, um, however challenging that may be. So on screen now, we see a number of important antiviral studies that have been plotted in accordance with the mean number of days from onset of symptoms to randomization or treatment. So although a number of these studies have shown uh, some pretty promising results, none of these studies are what you would call groundbreaking. And perhaps there's a simple reason for this. As you can see, the vast majority of the patients enrolled in these studies were administered the drug more than seven days after onset of symptoms, which basically falls outside of the optimum therapeutic window. So you can see that the, the viral load here has peaked out long before any of these antivirals um, were engaged. The earliest um, intervention conducted by the Shinkai et al. study, the phase three study that we just discussed, um, was able to get the drug um, into the patients on a, on a mean number of days of, I think, 5.9 days. So 5.9 or 4.9 days. Um, and even with that, we're still towards the natural, um, the natural uh, alleviation of the viral load peak out. Um, at that time of, of, uh, of uh, engagement. So the big question is this, you know, if we know that we are not, none of these studies have actually reflected the potential of real world use of these drugs, because when we're trying to enroll these patients into these studies, they have to go through a, a pretty intensive screening process. Uh, making sure that they hit all the marks for the inclusion criteria, making sure that they don't infringe on the exclusion criteria. So that screening process will take anywhere between maybe one day or two days. And by that time, um, you know, it, it's, it's very difficult to try to engage patients one or two or three days after onset of symptoms. But with that said, the question still remains, have we recognized the full potential of antivirals using these studies when the timing was suboptimum? And I think the answer is a resounding no. Um, and this is not only with regard to favipiravir, but also remdesivir and other antivirals that are, that are currently out there. So in conclusion, there is a growing body of evidence um, that supports the efficacy for COVID-19. There's more than 50 clinical trials to date that are either ongoing or that have been completed. Uh, a series of promising clinical investigations has led to the approvals for favipiravir for emergency treatment of COVID-19, and the drug has currently been approved in nine countries and counting. The safety of the drug continues to be well documented. There are no new unexpected or new serious safety issues that have been reported with favipiravir um, in COVID-19 studies. Um, the data is consistent largely with the previous safety studies. And the most common adverse event associated with the use of the drug, as we discussed earlier, is the transient hyperuricemia. Uh, again, this is very manageable and reversed after stopping drug administration. We also found that the safety profile of favipiravir, um, with exception to the hyperuricemia, was found to be similar to the placebo in randomized control studies. That concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity and uh, I welcome any questions. Thank you. Does anyone have any queries regarding the speech by Dr. Richard? I hope there are no queries. That's a wonderful speech, Dr. Richard. Thank you very much.